Good afternoon, all, and welcome to this session of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society History Group. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today, Phil Vasili, who is a researcher, author, playwright, filmmaker, football scout, trade unionist, and political activist. He has worked closely with us at the Barbados Museum, particularly when we developed our 2020 digital exhibition, Walter Tall, A Strong Heart Beating Loudly. However, today he will be sharing his research on another member of the Tall family through his presentation titled Reclamation, Daniel Tall, 1856 to 1897, The Journey of a Black Atlantic Migrant. Barbadian Daniel Tall arrived in Britain in 1876. It was the first unenforced migration his family had taken in generations. His enslaved West African ancestors were captives who survived the horrors of the Middle Passage. 150 years later, other people of color who decided on a similar journey to Daniel's are once again forced by the same UK institutions that had legitimized the captivity of their ancestors to undertake a Caribbean bound passage. This presentation by Phil traces Daniel's Black Atlantic journey, revealing an uncomfortable but indispensable history of Imperial Britain. Before we get started, just a small reminder that there will be a Q&A portion to this history group. And if you'd like to ask Phil any questions, please either raise your hand or submit them to the Q&A panel if you're joining us on Zoom, or if you're watching via Facebook, please submit them via the comment and our communications officer will transmit them to us here in the webinar. Welcome, Phil, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Natalie, and thanks to everyone that's taken the time to, to, um, to, to log in and, and uh, be part of this. What I, what I hope is, is an interactive discussion. Just to give you some background, um, I'm, I uh, was privileged to visit Barbados in 2019 uh, to do further research into the Tull family. I'd, I'd written a biography about Walter Tull, um, uh, but I, I wanted to explore the, fam the wider family. Um, so much of my research uh, kind of involved terrain that was new to me, such as the history of Barbados. So um, I just want to reiterate, I'm no, I'm no expert on the history of Barbados. I think I know the tolls pretty well by now, but uh, I, you know, I'm more than happy for people to put me right if, if they think I'm, I'm off beam with, uh, with, with my uh, historical context. Um, what really um, surprised me when I began to look, you know, I did we researched that the Barbados archives at Black Rock and, and also prior to visiting Barbados at the Moravian um, archive in London, there's, there's uh, um, the main Moravian church archive in Pennsylvania, but the tolls were Moravians. Uh, they attended the Moravian church on the island and um, the, the, what I found was, you know, the, the, the Moravians were meticulous record keepers and so information that, about the enslaved communities that wasn't available elsewhere, um, you could pick up fragments of of people's lives and family lives from the Mar Moravian records, which uh, was a real kind of um, bonus for for my research. The other the other aspect uh, of delving into the kind of history of Barbados and the history of the Atlantic slave trade and um, was the integral um, role of, of the, the institution of the monarchy, which I hadn't realized. Um, and if the, the first um, UK company dedicated primarily to um, the enslavement of people and the trade in enslavement was set up by the Stuarts 
Um, this this is the dated 1667, but actually the, the Royal Adventurers was set up a few years before. But as you can see, um, it says uh, it, it lays out the purpose of the company uh, as we see now as you know uh, shocking but that that uh, that was the nature of of, um, of it, it kind of represented um, the the Stuart kind of obsession with uh, mercantilist trade um, so that that was um, something I it, it was a, an eye opener for me uh, the core role of, of of the royal family as an institution in the slave trade uh, and we can see that uh, allied with merchants in the city of London um, it was really a collaboration between the Stuart Royal family, these early slave trading companies, and um, merchants in the city of London. So while the Royal family, the Stuarts, including Charles II, James, the Duke of York, who became James II, um, and other members of the Royal family, held the largest number of stock in these early slave trading companies, um, the the number of subscribers, the largest number of subscribers, was uh, City of London merchants, um, and these included uh, other aristocrats and people like um, the head of the East India Company, Sir Josiah Child, um, the East India Company. So the notorious East India Company, which um, basically uh, colonized India, um, was the main or was the largest kind of um, company trading in, in uh, abroad at that time in the 17th century. Um, it was, it, it's, Eric Williams in his book about capitalism and slavery kind of uh, explains all of this in detail um, and, and in a much more articulate way than myself. But um, it, what he argues, Williams, is that the, the template for Britain's industrial revolution actually can be, he thinks, traced back to the, um, the way sugar production was organized in Barbados and the division of labor. Uh, and uh, that provided, that, that division of labor uh, provided the template for Britain's and the resources for Britain's industrial revolution. I mean, the, the, the income that the city of London merchants and the crown received from Barbados in the 17th century was enormous. Um, you can see here um, that it was the large, Barbados was the largest um, contributor to the, the exchequer, to the, the British exchequer uh, in, in the 17th century, an enormous sum of money, hundreds of millions in today's figures. It says 363,000. 918 in 1686, which was hundreds of millions. Um, so it was a, an enormous source of wealth for the British monarchy and, and aristocracy. Um, so obviously all of this um, needed vast amounts of labor and um, you know, the one thing that these royal slave trading companies like the Royal Adventurers and the Royal Africa Company did was industrialize the, the trade in slaves. And um, it's interesting because obviously with the reparations movement, 
that's a, that's a, hopefully building up speed at the moment. Um, the response of Britain has been shameful, really, in the sense that it's uh, it's refused to pay any reparations, um, despite the fact that you know millions of people were transported from West Africa, and with a good proportion dying on the way in the Middle Passage. Um, but uh, hopefully, that as as another issue um, will be resolved in favour of the Caribbean countries and those families and people that are descendants of those that were enslaved. Um, the Tulls were uh, members of the Moravian church. And as I said, the Moravians were meticulous record keepers. They first arrived in Barbados in the 1760s. And um, their purpose was specifically to, to kind of proselytize amongst the enslaved uh, peoples of the island. And at first, um, this, uh, the response of the planters was uh, very kind of, it, it, very negative. Um, obviously the, the laws uh, forbade enslaved people from becoming Christians and the thought uh, of these Moravian missionaries um, proselytizing amongst the enslaved population and teaching them uh, Christian values of uh, equality and liberty and uh, and um, brotherly love and and such things was was uh, produced kind of feelings of horror. In, in many planters, but there were one or two sympathetic um, planters that allowed uh, the Moravian missionaries onto their plantations. Um, and the, the, the good thing um, about the Moravians, there was many, they, they, they themselves were uh, slave owners, they they were apolitical as um, a religious group. They that was a speci an official policy that they wouldn't involve themselves in the politics of the countries in which they were situated, in which they were had their missionary stations. Uh, this stemmed from their roots, where they had to move from their uh, from where they originated in Central Europe to Germany because of uh, the political uh, oppression they were facing. So they developed an ethos whereby they wouldn't involve themselves in national politics, which obviously in such a contentious kind of geopolitical environment as the Caribbean, um, would seem at odds with what they were trying to do, which was to uh, Christianize an enslaved population that had hitherto been prevented by law from being Christians. So they were, they were working within a very contradictory atmosphere and context. Um, and they kept, the slide I've got up is actually of a slave the 1817 slave register, but uh, the Moravians themselves kept much fuller records of their enslaved congregations. So they would record, if known, the, um, the origins of the enslaved person, uh, whether, they were, whether they were an Igbo, whether they were uh, born in Barbados, what their African name was originally, um, what they preferred to be known by. Uh, so there are details that are missing uh, or not recorded by the official slave registers. So there's much more detail to be gleaned from the Moravian uh, archives uh, relating to 
the enslaved population that was part of their congregation than we can find in the slave registers. But um, Daniel's father uh, was originally known as William Chris. Uh, and here we find on the Clifton Hill, sorry, Clifton Hall uh, plantation, we find a William Chris um, age nine. And this, I, I feel, is the William Chris that later, uh, after emancipation, uh, changed his name to William Tull uh, and, and was Daniel's father. Um, the, oddly enough, um, the planter's attitude to the Moravians changed gradually because with this apolitical stance and um, with the uh, ethos of, of, of discipline and education, uh, the, the certain planters tended to feel that it produced a more obedient uh, workforce. Uh, so Moravian people who attended the Moravian churches or chapel and uh, where education was very important. Each Moravian uh, chapel had a Sunday school and evening school uh, where, where uh, the New Testament would be taught and where their, their scholars uh, who were otherwise in their daily lives enslaved uh, on the plantation would be taught to read and write. And uh, planters felt that this produced a more obedient uh, or better worker. So um, we can see in red here the amount of um, Moravian chapels by, by the mid 19th century. Uh, Clifton Hill, Mount Tabor, Sharon, Grace Hill in Bridgetown. Um, so for William and Anatole, um, William Tull, formerly Chris, married Anna in 1838. Um, he changed his name, as I said, when he was uh, when he took Holy Communion. Uh, Anna told I couldn't find the origins of Anna um, in the records. Um, there was I couldn't find an Anna Tull on any of any any of the slave registers. Um, but I did find uh, names that could have been kind of formalized into, her name was Anna Lashley. And there, for instance, there was a kind of, um, a, a Nanny Francis, her name was Anna Francis Lashley. Uh, but there was a Nanny Francis uh, as a young child in, in one of the 1820s registers. And, Again, on emancipation, uh, the names, uh, naming became um, an important feature of the emancipated people's uh, identity. Uh, you know, just the mere fact that they could name themselves and weren't being named by the slave masters uh, meant often they would formalize uh, their names and, and give themselves two names or even three names. So, um, yeah, there are, there are candidates uh, for people who may have been Anna, uh, but I couldn't find I couldn't uh, find any definitive evidence to say, oh yeah, Anna came from this plantation. But they um, they they both were living in the Clifton Hill area because uh, William was, was enslaved on the Clifton Hall plantation. And they, um, they attended Sharon 
um, uh, Moravian church, um, which had, um, you know, its school where Anna, certainly Anna, learnt to, to read and write. And actually, there's evidence uh, in her letters that she was very fluent and articulate. Um, and, you know, comparing Anna's style of writing, because we have in, in the Finlayson family archive, uh, there are two letters written by Anna to Daniel. Um, if we compare these letters to, say, uh, another letter in the archive written by um, Daniel's prospective mother-in-law, um, it the you know the grammat the grammar and the style uh, of Anna it, it, in comparison it seems to be more fluent. So um, you know it, it wasn't until the 1870s in Britain there was um, compulsory education, but um, you know it was it was certainly. Uh, uh, an achievement uh, by Anna and the Moravians in that, you know, this level of kind of um, education um, was achieved amongst the enslaved uh, population. Um, obviously, William would have been, while Anna, I don't know if she was alive, I think she was born around the time of the Bussa Rebellion, uh, 1816, according to a, her, you know, her um, record in the cemetery uh, record book. Uh, but William was, uh, would have been around eight uh, at the time of the rebellion. So given the, you know, the all-encompassing nature of it. Uh, I know it didn't, uh, there weren't kind of uprisings in all parts of the island, but certainly news of the rebellion, the uprising would have traveled if, uh, if it didn't affect the plantation um, that he was on. Um, so it led, um, he would have seen, uh, and, and it, and heard, we certainly would have heard, if not seen, he would have heard about um, the, the revenge. I call it a rampage of revenge by planters, you know, with summary executions. It was a horrific time for anyone who was thought to be or suspected of being involved in, in the uh, uprising. And, um, you know, even later, uh, the two American abolitionists that visited um, the island uh, were shocked uh, at the stories they heard. Um, this is from uh, a quote from Hilary Beckles' uh, book, but it, uh, it, it's uh, the US, he's quoting US abolitionist Tomer Kimball. And uh, you know it talks about sorry, it talks about this uh, one particular person who said he would, uh, you know, basically just kill uh, any Negroes that he felt like killing. And uh, uh, yeah, this is like the first slave he met on the estate. He accused of being concerned in the rebellion. This is. Uh, the, the uh, Bursa Rebellion. So um, it was, you know, it, it was uh, a situation of terror for, for the enslaved population after 1816. And, um, you know, one, you can hardly imagine. Um, the kind of uh, terror uh, that and uh, that people that people had to face, um, you know, the situation legally was that 
you you were born literally born an outlaw if you were enslaved the, the, the law you had no recourse to the law uh, for any injustice i mean injustice obviously was uh you don't need me you know, uh, reiterating this but injustice was a daily way of life um now uh, you know it's interesting given this kind of background to to the formative years of william's uh, life that's uh it's uh you the question arises why did he name why did he choose the name toll uh, and there's no definitive answer to that. Um, however, it is interesting that in the 1823 counter address, which was uh, an, an address, it was to the Barbados Parliament, but it, it was in response to uh, a pledge of loyalty, really, by other freedmen, uh, free uh, people of colour, pledging their, their loyalty to, um, to the Barbados Parliament and, and uh, to those that ruled the island. And uh, the counter address was saying, look, we demand, uh, you know, legal rights that should be the, the, uh, the natural right of any human being that uh, rights apply to all legal rights apply to all and there are a number of tolls there's four tolls to this counter address i don't i don't know if that inspired william or uh the new any of them uh but that that's uh that that was something i found uh that may have inspired him and here's a a full list in the Barbadian newspaper uh, published in February 1824. Here's a full list of those people that signed the counter address. You know, a very large number of uh, free uh, Barbadians signed that counter address. Um, now, Daniel, when he when he came to England. Um, and I'm, I'm jumping ahead here, but it's relevant to uh, this, uh, me being able to tell his story. Daniel kept a journal. I mean, it must be, it's an enormous um, cultural asset, historical asset, because there, I've not come across another kind of diary almost. Uh, of it's not very long it's five or six pages again it's it's in the Finlayson and family archive but it's you know it's very rare for a, a working class uh caribbean migrant a victorian caribbean migrant to have kept such a record of moments in his life so thankfully daniel kept it uh, Daniel recorded some of the moments in his life, which gives us a kind of real entry point into exploring uh, in detail, in further detail, these moments. Um, what we know is that from uh, the late 1830s, they started worshipping at um, the Clifton Hill Moravian Chapel. And uh, this uh, this is some of the the, the shacks, uh, chateau houses that are still there in Clifton Hill. Um, now, Anna described her home in the 1870s when she was living in My Lord's Hill as our little heart. And it's just, a, that, uh, I suppose, wouldn't have been much different. Um, so the congregation uh, moved, those that were nearer Clifton Hill, that worshipped at Sharon, moved over 
in the late 1830s. And this is the Clifton Hill Moravian Church. And um, this is where, according to the record book, um, Anna, William and Anna married in 1838. The, the, although the church wasn't dedicated until 1839. So maybe there was uh, a congregation meeting before or building the church uh, when Anna and William were married. And it was here that William was committed to Holy Communion in 1839. Um, and Again, from the fin Finlayson family archive, which is a wonderful repository of, of documents relating to the to wider Toll family, we have um, this. This is not a good reproduction. I apologise for this. Um, this is Anna uh, taken, I think, possibly in the 1870s. In in one of the two letters that. Um, she writes, I think the 1878 one, um, which we'll come to. Um, she thanks Daniel for sending her some money. Um, and he sends her a portrait of himself, which has been, is, it didn't survive. But um, she also says, you know, I, I'll, I, suggest that she was getting a portrait done of herself. So this may have been the result, uh, this, this, uh, this portrait of her in the, 18, in the 1870s. Um, so they, the church at um, Clifton Hill, uh, this is the interior. I was, I was lucky enough to visit it in 2019 and um, it's a beautiful place um, and you know it it brought I was gonna say it brought to life but it kind of colored the detail of which I'd, I'd been reading so much about um, the Moravian chapel here uh, and looking at the Moravian records in London that it, you know it was wonderful to visit it and, and get a, a real feel of of uh, the place in which um, Anna and William um, worshipped and where as very young children or a very young child, Daniel would have, would have worshipped. I mean, the, William and Anna had five children. I just have to refer. Um, Sarah Elizabeth, born April 30th, 1842. Um, William, who was born in 1845, Samuel James, who was born in 1848, and Daniel, uh, who was born in 1856, and Prince Henry, who was born in 1850. So um, all of the children um, would have worshipped in this church. And I assume, well, I know. Well, I, I assume attended the the uh, the school that was attached to the church. Um, this is the um, this is a, a commemoration plate inside the church. Say that the, it was established in eighteen thirty nine, dedicated in eighteen forty one, um, and this was the the sorry I took these photographs, so they're not great quality. As you can see, um, but this there is a window at the side, um, but this was the schoolhouse, the, the Clifton Day School, and you know records show that it had sixty or seven sixty to seventy pupils who often well it was fee paying you 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 had to pay something, um, and. You know, I assume that people would have, I mean, uh, paid pennies, but uh, um, the income that is Moravians, as I say, kept meticulous records, and, and it shows that the, the income was something like 12 shillings a year. 
from this school. Um, but this is where um, Daniel uh, would have first uh, attended class. Um, and and his and his uh, older brothers and sisters. Um, this is one of Anna's letters, um, and it's not very clear, um, but you can see actually the beautiful writing um, and and the way uh, the, 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 the script and, and the style is is. Uh, you know, it, it speaks volumes for the level of education that um, they receive and their dedication to learning. Um, this, this is the transcription of the letter. And um, uh, talking about the, the portrait, um, it, she, she, you know, uh, thanks Daniel for sending uh, the portrait, um, but she says that I, I'll, the next opportunity I, I can get money to try and oblige your request. So I'm assuming that, you know, that may have been Daniel asking him, asking his mother to send, to have a portrait done, to send over to England so he can show his, his uh, friends and, and future family. Um, and he also mentions, or she also mentions her godmother, Mrs. Simmons. Uh, that that uh, Simmons was one of the close friends of the Tulls. And uh, in, in the records of sponsors uh, at baptisms and marriages, we find that the Simmons feature uh, and, and other people like the Skeets feature quite often. So there was a, um, a network of uh, friends and uh, that was building, uh, you know, that, that would have been kind of destroyed in a, in a plantation context, uh, an enslaved plantation context, but that uh, post-emancipation uh, was was really important to um, the emancipated people. Um, so going back to the journal, uh, Daniel says that they moved to My Lord's Hill in the early 1860s, and they uh, worshipped at uh, the Moravian Chapel in Roebuck Street, which is this chapel, um, and it's here that he got um, most of his education. And um, the, the, the one, the other uh, feature, another, another feature of Moravian kind of ethos and practice was that um, their congregations should, should be kind of involved in, in, in the teaching of themselves, you know, so that uh, pupils then became teachers like Edgehill and Moore became teachers of um, uh, when they became adults uh, and Edgehill himself became uh, quite a re renowned um, educationalist in Barbados in, in, in the late, mid to late um, 1800s. And he taught at Sharon and I think uh, at Roebuck Street, but I might, but certainly at Sharon. Um, so we know that Daniel was uh, apprenticed. He writes in his journal of being apprenticed to, um, as, a, as a carpenter. And, um, and it wasn't a very happy time. He didn't, he, he didn't find uh, his apprentice masters, he had three, he didn't find them um, very uh, tolerant or accommodating really, he, 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 and, he, and he got into terrible 
row with one about non-payment, which upset his father. And he was upset by his father because he felt that his father, William, didn't kind of support him and actually took the side of his, as he called it, his oppressor. Um, and he said, you know, uh, he, he, I think that was one of the reasons that he decided to leave Barbados. I mean, obviously, um, the economic circumstances by the mid 19th century were worsening. Um, the sugar, uh, sugar production, or the trade in sugar was falling. Um, there was widespread poverty and famine. And um, the day rates on other islands were greater. So in, in 1873, um, we know Daniel records that he sailed to St. Lucia and he worked there, excuse me, until 1876 when he sailed for England. And uh, I don't know, I can't find any disembarkation records. Uh, uh, for, for Daniel's entry into Britain and uh, but the timing of his voyage suggests that there were two ships that he may have traveled on the Netherton and the Sarah and uh, so this this was the only image I could find of the Netherton <laughs> which was wrecked uh, off the coast, uh, this is taken from about 1900, I think, but anyway. Um, now, Daniel was literate. He was, um, a, had a skilled trade and he was, um, you know, a, um, a believer uh, and he attended chapel. Now these three kind of factors were, were important cultural uh, items in, his, in, in the baggage that he carried over um, because the Moravians and uh, other nonconformist communities had um, a wide cultural as well as spiritual but wide cultural and, and social networks and although there wasn't a Moravian church in the town that he settled in in Britain which was Folkestone uh, it did have a Methodist church and um, the this was where this was kind of Daniel's social hub really this is where um, he attended church this is where he sang in the choir. This is where he held an official um, post as what was called a visitor. And now um, a visitor um, was, was uh, someone from the church who would literally visit uh, people that had applied to the church for funds in, in moments of, of kind of hardship. So if they were unemployed or they, for some reason, had expenses they couldn't meet, there was a fund um, that where they could be helped uh, by the, the Methodist community. And Daniel's job as a visitor was to literally visit people in their homes and assess their needs and decide whether they were eligible and he could he could disperse funds of up to one shilling i'm not sure what one shilling would be worth now but it would be pounds you know it would it would be uh if we think the the average wage of a an agricultural laborer in the 1890s in britain was 14 shillings a week um, so that's like half a day's pay, really. Or it's, it's such, anyway, it's just a substantial sum. But the 
the kind of um, unique kind of cultural phenomenon of, you know, a man of color visiting poor whites in their homes and assessing their needs and dispersing funds wouldn't have been a common sight uh, in, in many communities. And it, it, it speaks volumes as to the trust and the respect that Daniel um, had amongst the Methodist community. Um, and it was uh, one of his main employers was a man called Holden. And Holden was one of the, uh, the a key figure in the Grace Hill Methodist Church. And as we'll see later, he was one of the key figures of the uh, Poor Law Union, the, the kind of body that, the official local government body that, that um, decided on whether uh, people in need should go into the workhouse or could be given funds out of the rates. Uh, so, so he met some some kind of sorry that that's a better I don't know why it's suddenly come up uh, much clearer but in the background um, there you've got the railway viaduct there um, which is quite significant because the Folkestone in the second half of the nineteenth century was a booming coastal town it became a railhead for trips to for uh, the boat train to France, um, and uh, so yeah, it, it it was a it was a thriving coastal resort when Daniel uh, moved to it, settled in it, and it was at Grace Hill that Daniel met Alice. Um, uh, Alice Palmer. Um, she came from a rural agricultural family and um, yeah so they they had five children uh, William and sorry Daniel and Alice uh, including uh, Edward uh, and Walter who became and sorry and Elsie who were recognized um, either within their towns and cities, and certainly in Walter's case and Elsie's case nationally, for their contribution to society. So they there was quite a bequest and a legacy they left behind. Um, their first child, Bertha, died within a few months. Uh, and then William was born, then Cecilia, Edward, Walter, and Elsie. Um, tragically, and let's just, one, if you bear with me one moment, I'll just get the next slide up. Um, yeah, that's, this is a letter where we're talking about letters and comparisons between Anna uh, and Alice's mum, Sarah Ann. Um, and, but this is, a, although Sarah Ann didn't have such a fluent style as Anna, and, and, uh, and she, this is, I think, a beautiful letter in the sense that it, it shows that colour meant nothing to the Palmer family. Um, they they were really from this letter they were really happy to have Dan as she calls him as her prospective son-in-law and you know she said don't whatever you do don't take her out of England whilst I'm alive and you know be careful because she's a tender plant but she says you know I'm perfectly satisfied uh, that you love her and um, you know it's just a lovely letter of tolerance and, and uh, welcome to the family. And um, it's, it, it's counterintuitive in, the, you know, we kind of, we, in, in a sense, in, it was inferred that everyone in the past in Britain was racist. Uh, um, and I think it, 
you know, it's certainly, it was a very difficult time for people of colour uh, in Victorian Britain. But there were pockets of tolerance. And, uh, you know, this is one, uh, one family that were very welcoming to their future son-in-law. Um, they lived, they lived in um, the Hyde districts of Folkestone. Um, and this is uh, Allendale Street where Walter was born. And this is where uh, their main home, uh, number 51, Walton Road. They, these both are quite near each other. Allendale Street is quite near Walton Road. Um, you see the, the kind of uh, working class terraced houses would have looked quite different in the Victorian period with different windows and they wouldn't have been painted. Or well, I don't think they would have been painted anyway. Certainly wouldn't have had a green bin in a car outside anyway. But, um, and the school was just literally at the top of the school that the children attended was just at the top of the road. Um, so this is um, Daniel's journal. Um, and it's significant um, in so many different ways, but Alice died uh, in 1895 of um, cancer. Um, and in the journal, which is again from the Finlayson fin fin family archive. Um, she, Daniel records her will. And at the end, he also records his will, which um, he, yeah, I'll come to that. I don't want to kind of, uh, but anyway, so it, it, it's a really special document. Um, so Alice died in 1895, um, but they knew there was from they knew from about 1893 that she was terminally ill, um, which must have been very very difficult for everyone. Um, you know, there was no welfare state in Britain at the time. You're really uh, on your own in terms of. Um, resources but as members of the Methodist community they did have that support where they could turn to the church and did for help financially and they began it and the church itself became a great source of help. Um, the only portrait or, or photograph we have of the family was taken I think uh, and again there's no definitive proof but given the way they're dressed and the fact that Alice isn't in the photo I'm assuming this was taken on the day of her funeral um, because they're nearly all dressed in black you've got Cecilia, um, William, Walter, Edward, obviously Daniel and Elsie um yeah and you can see their cheeks are uh puffed out on one side i think they might have been sucking gobstoppers or sweets uh, uh maybe daniel provided those as some kind of uh i don't want to use the word compensation but just to take their minds off the solemnity of the, the uh the, the, the uh, occasion but it's a beautiful photograph and um, you know it, it it's again a testimony to Daniel's kind of um, hard work really just just the fact that he could clothe his children in such uh, in suits and 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 you know dresses and hats um, which in itself, for a family of five was an achievement. Um, 
so it was because the Tulls and the Palmers, Alice's family, were very close. When Alice died, which, as I say, was foreshadowed, um, it was decided amongst or agreed amongst the two families that Alice's niece, Clara, would marry Daniel. Uh, and it's recorded that it was said that it was largely to mother, to quote, to mother the children, but uh, they themselves had a child, Miriam. So, it, it, you know, there was uh, love and affection involved. And Edward, he talks about his family life as being happy. He, he wrote uh, quite extensively about his family life as, as, a, as an adult. And he said they, he, he used the word happy. They had a happy family life, which revolved around the church. So um, in 1896, Daniel married Clara, who was the daughter of Alice's brother, William. Um, yeah, sorry, this, I'm jumping forward. I, um, let's go back to that. Um, but within, within a year of that marriage, um, well, ex almost exactly a year later, they had uh, Miriam, and then two months after the birth of Miriam, Daniel died of, of heart disease um, in 1897, in, in December 1897. Um, and a year before, his mother had died, uh, but it isn't recorded in his in his uh, journal. So um, I'm assuming he didn't know. Um, and I know that's a big assumption, but it, it possibly had he known it, he would have recorded it. But she died aged 81 in 1896. Um, which is, suggests she was born around 1816, 1817, I think. The mass is not great, but I think sometime around there. Now it says she died of, uh, she died in the lunatic asylum. And it, I don't think it's because of her mental health. At that time, the lunatic asylum helped or, or had patients that, either had contagious diseases and needed to be quarantined or had long-term illnesses uh, and needed constant care. So it's, uh, and I'm guessing now that, um, you know, she died of what we call a hemorrhage today. Uh, it would have been because she needed constant care. Um, in, in Daniel's journal, as I said, he, both he, he recorded his wife's will, but he also laid out his will. And in it, he said that his carpentry tool should go to his son, William, unless one of the other uh, children, uh, boys, uh, took up carpentry, which they didn't. So uh, William uh, was given his tools. This is William um, in 1914, um, building um, these, what would be barracks for the soldiers um, leaving for the First World War. Folkestone was uh, uh, one of the ports where many soldiers embarked for France where they it was it, it was where Walter actually his brother William's brother Walter he left for France in 1915 from uh, Folkestone so <clears throat> these huts that they were building would have been used to house these soldiers um, 
that were leaving for France. Um, yeah, and one, you know, I talk about the the something that's not often talked about is that the cultural legacy that he brought um, as the son of enslaved parents, um, which was an enormous uh, kind of internal courage um, and stoicism that I actually noticed when I was in Barbados, and excuse me talking as an outsider about things that you probably uh, are commonplace to you, but I, I, I felt that I could see elements of that, um, what I felt was a, an inner strength um, that his children um, exhibited, no doubt exhibited because of their achievements. Um, and that, you know, you can imagine life on the plantation and uh, um, as an enslaved person, you, you know, you would one moment of kind of uh, of loss of control of your, your temper or whatever could lead to your death. So you had to be incredibly kind of uh, restrained and self-disciplined, but also incredibly strong and courageous internally to, to actually, um, you know, to deal with your, your, the, the, the daily life that you faced. So I think that shows itself in and that request that he left his children, whether he knew it or not, uh, obviously comes out in their achievements. Um, and you've got, you know, Elsie was awarded an MBE um, for a voluntary work at a hospital in uh, Folkestone. Um, and it's, it's, you know, she, she refused, <laughs> she refused to go to the palace to get it. Now, I don't know if that was a political decision, um, she knew about, um, or whether it's just that uh, physically she didn't feel able, because she's in her 80s then, able to go with her failing her eyesight. And, and uh, you know, she wasn't as physically um, uh, healthy as she obviously would have been earlier in her early life. Or whether it's because um, she knew about the role of the monarchy in, in the enslavement of her ancestors. Uh, but anyway, Lord Heaver, Lord Astor of Heaver, came to her toward the MBE, which I, I think, you know, again, speaks to that kind of defiant obstinacy that you, is, is noticeable in, in the Tull family. Uh, it's a very endearing, um, quality. Uh, Walter, who is now, um, you know, a cultural icon, a historical icon in Britain, and he's uh, part of the, he's officially recognised as in the Dictionary of National Biography. He has, a re he has an entry in the Dictionary of National Biography. He was one of the first, if not the first, Black Britain to be commissioned as an officer. Uh, in the British Army in the First World War, which is an incredible achievement in itself. One of the first Black Britons to play professional football at the highest level for Tottenham Hotspur. Um, yeah, and, uh, and, and a really well-respected and loved figure then and now, actually, he's, he's, as, as time moves on, his reputation uh, uh, and and uh, respect for him has increased. And here we have Edward um, playing one of the games he loves. He was also a very good footballer playing for Air Park House. Uh, he was a dentist. He was president of his old boys association. And he was winner 
of uh, many cups, many golf cups, including the, the Turnberry tournament. Um, and this was at a time when golf clubs were notoriously discriminatory and they wouldn't allow women and they certainly uh, didn't allow people of colour usually to join. But it shows um, the respect Edward had amongst those communities in which he moved, uh, that he was a member of Turnberry Golf Club. So, um, you know, what a legacy uh, Daniel left uh, in terms of, um, you know, what he achieved uh, in his life in Britain, which was counterintuitive to, um, you know, this idea of that was dominant, uh, you know, at the time of people of colour about being less evolved and, you know, a kind of um, inferior. And the legacy embodied in his children that he left behind of, of great achievement and national recognition. So I'll, um, I'll leave it there and, and look forward to any questions or any contributions and, uh, that anyone may have. Um, for your wonderful presentation. You know, we often think of post-emancipation migration from the Caribbean to the UK through the lens of the Windrush generation in the mid-20th century. And so it's fascinating to take a deep dive into migration stories of Barbadians in this earlier period um, and the impact that they had on their areas in the UK. So thank you for that. Um, just a friendly reminder for everybody that you can share any questions that you have in the Q&A panel, or you can also raise your hand and we can enable your microphone um, to ask your question directly. We do have one comment that was brought over from Facebook um, from Barbara Hilton, and she commented that the presentation is interesting and she was inquiring why um, she doesn't hear more about this, why it's not available on our local news channel after the evening news, these kinds of stories. Um, so I think she is very engaged. And um, yep, I'm not seeing any other questions at this time. Um, but what I'd like to ask you, Phil, I think you mentioned it a couple times throughout your talk, but how do you find, you know, apart from the extensive work that the Finlayson family have done to preserve their archive, how do you find accessing records? You know, you have such detailed accounts of the lives of the Tall family. How has that journey been in trying to collate that information um, for your research and your publication? Um, well, it, uh, it's uh, my research into the Tell Family started with, with Walter, really, when I was looking at um, his life as a, as a soldier and footballer. And, and fortunately, in terms of Walter's um, existence, because he was institutionalised, he, he went into an orphanage with Edward at nine. Uh, he then became a professional footballer and then became an army officer. Those three domains all held, uh, all, all attracted record keeping. So the orphanage um, kept records of his, uh, of all of the letters that were uh, sent by those people in Folkestone, the, the Methodists in Folkestone that were proposing or asking for the Edward and Walter be, to be allowed entry into the orphanage. Uh, the records the orphanage itself kept uh, about their progress, um, the application, extensive application form, which had lots of detail about their family life and background. Uh, again, as, as a footballer, Walter did lots of interviews, there were match reports. So the, his interviews, he revealed lots of de uh, details about his family life. And as a, an army officer, 
Um, again, there's extensive um, detail about his um, his active career, uh, much more so because he was an officer. If he was if he wasn't an officer, if he hadn't become an officer, there'd have been less detail and information. But also another uh, source of um, incredibly detailed information, the primary source really, was the Finlayson family archive, because Edward was a meticulous record keeper. He kept all of Walter's letters, photographs, family photographs. He, he, I think, I mean, I don't know if Edward did it, I'm, I'm sure he did it out of just love for his family because he, he was the kind of patriarch of the family. Um, but also, I was so fortunate that there's this, there's this wonderful repository of, of uh, memorabilia, letters, uh, and, and uh, photographs, medals, um, that gives such a detailed insight into their lives. Also, the, the Barbados archives at Blackrock was a great source of, of information. Um, and the, the archivists there were fantastic. They, they, they bent over backwards to, to help me and find information about um, the Tull family. Um, the, as I say, the Moravian records were a great source, and I think underutilized actually, especially there's one specific dimension of the uh, a cultural dimension to uh, the Moravian church was this uh, the process of what they called speaking was as part of the the kind of run up to Holy Communion members of the con congregation were, had to speak about their faith. And they, they would, they were basically, it was a confessional to, the, to an open confessional. And although I couldn't find any speaking records relating to the tolls, speaking records do exist. So you've got uh, speaking, and I think most of them are actually in Pennsylvania. Or, or in America, anyway. Um, but there you've got a source of enslaved people talking about their lives. Now, a very, very rare, um, you know, kind of uh, primary source, really. So, and, and I don't live far also from the British Library, which as a, as a copyright library um, has, you know, an enormous amount of documents and news, newspapers and books um, that are out of print and, and, and kind of rare. So I was able to draw upon the resources there. So, yeah. Thanks, Phil. And yeah, the Moravian Church definitely was a central site um, in the narrative that you shared today. Do you know if um, Daniel's children continued in the tradition of the Moravian Church, like Elsie, Edward, were they active within the church as well? They, they were active in the Methodist Church. I think that was um, because I don't think there was a Moravian Church in Folkestone. And so the kind of nearest equivalent for Daniel was, was a Methodist as a nonconformist uh, religious group. And so he, and so the the Tull stroke Finlayson's Warnocks um, are, yeah, uh, they're, they're, they, they're, through the generations, they, they still uh, attend and, and uh, are, are kind of, um, for instance, the uh, Edwards children are members of the Iona congregation up in Scotland. Um, and uh, Edward was uh, attended Wesleyan Street Methodist Church in Glasgow, um, and 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 actually Walter did as well. On um, there's a commemorative; it's no longer there the church, but there's a commemorative 
a kind of plaque that records the people who died, members of the congregation who died in the First World War. Walter's name is on that plaque. Um, and yeah, so the Methodist Church is, is, a, is an important um, element of, of the Tull's life and that, that religious belief has been passed down. Thanks, Phil. We have a couple questions coming through now in our Q&A panel. Um, one is from Kim Howard on Facebook, and she says, thank you, Mr. Vasili, for this presentation. I may have missed it, but do we know where William Tall was buried? Also, have you been able to identify any of Daniel's siblings or their descendants? I think William um, is buried in Folkestone. Um, he's got he's he no, William did you it, it was William yeah that you you asked about yeah she asked where yeah. William Toll was buried yeah, yeah. No, William ah oh, sorry William the father the father yes I believe sorry, so I, yeah yes. not 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 yeah I don't know where William I I did look around I spent a day um with um, a member of your community, um, I'm sorry, uh, I, the, his name is on the tip of my tongue, and it's terrible, it, it, I've, uh, but he helped me look around, or, or took me to Westbury Cemetery, West, Westbury Cemetery, where I looked at the record book, but I couldn't find um, uh, William's grave. Um, but I think that's where he's buried, Westbury Cemetery. Yeah. He 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 lived. He died in 1900. Uh, so he he was quite an age. It was in his 90s when he died, William. Um, and sorry, Natalie, what was the other part of the question? The second part of the question is if you had been able to identify any of Daniel's siblings. Well. Siblings or descendants? Um, yeah. I think... Sorry, um, I was just going to say. Sorry. No, sorry, Phil. I was just going to say that ties into another question that we have from Janice Mears, who says, Thank you for this fascinating story. Have you started or contemplated any work on linkages with any tall descendants here in Barbados? Um, right. So it's. Link toll Barbados toll. I'm just and um, Daniel's siblings. Um, so, as far as Daniel's siblings go, um, there were four, that he was he was one of five. So Sarah Elizabeth, who was born in 1842, William, who was born in 1845. Samuel James, born in 1848, and Prince Henry, born in 1850. Now, I don't know, uh, didn't, Sarah had children, um, one of which I think became a pastor in Antigua. Um, also, um, one of, One of um, his brother's children, um, Samuel's children, let me get this right. Um, he moved to Harlem in New York um, and lived in Harlem for um, 20 years or so and, and, and died there age 53 um, um, yeah so I managed to he died he died of tuberculosis so some of his siblings I could trace and others disappeared from view uh, may I, there, there was a cholera outbreak in 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 Barbados uh, in the mid 19th century, there was also the famine. So may, I don't know if one or two of the children of his siblings died in that, but one, um, William, 
I couldn't trace. Um, and Prince Henry, I, I couldn't trace. Um, as far as Barbados tiles go, um, no, I, I did try um, to find if I, if I could um, find any, but I, I failed basically. So if anyone's, anyone knows of any Barbados toes related to uh, William and Anna and Daniel, obviously that would be fantastic. Um, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Phil. And hopefully our librarian Harriet is watching because she runs a genealogy group. So maybe some of her members might be interested in taking on some of that. Um, we have one of our attendees here, Rennie, who has their hand up. Rennie. So that, I'm just going to invite them. So Rennie was the name I was trying to remember. Rennie was fantastic. He took me to Westbury Cemetery and made oh, we, okay. had, we, we met while I was in Barbados. Yeah, Ren and Rennie is a great Spurs supporter as well. So we often <laughs> it, it sends messages about Tottenham's <laughs> performance. Sorry, Rennie. Uh, so it, Rennie, you can ask a question. Folks as happen. Uh, th thanks, Natalie. Um, hi, Phil. Great to hear you as always on this subject I am so passionate on. Um, I remember there was a movement to try to award um, Walter uh, the Victoria Cross. The military cross. The military cross, I'm sorry. Has has that happened? No. Um, I I think it's a terrible injustice, Rene. Um, we've been pushing. Walter was recommended, just to give the background for people who don't know, Walter was for an act of, he was cited for bravery and heroism uh, uh, by his... Uh, divisional commander um, and was recommended for a military cross. Now, normally, given Walter's length of service from 1914 to 1918, it would have been it, it, it would have been just a, a, a box ticking exercise. He would have got a military cross because he, he you know, he'd served so long uh, and he was recommended and given a citation by his divisional commander, but they didn't, get, they didn't award it to him. And we, and I think it's because at the time, the, the, um, the uh, manual of military law uh, forbade people of color from becoming officers, from becoming infantry officers. You, you could become a medical officer, i.e. a doctor, you couldn't become um, uh, an infantry officer. Uh, the idea was that white soldiers wouldn't respect you or take orders from you, which Walter just disproved. Again, another counterintuitive uh, achievement. Um, so I think that was the reason he wasn't given it or uh, it wasn't uh, progressed because he embodied a contradiction, a legal contradiction. But we have tried for years and years, and it's been reviewed a number of times by the MOD, uh, this decision. And each time they knock it back, uh, uh, shamefully, actually, because there, there, have, there have been cases of military crosses being awarded posthumously. So it, it, they can do it. There, there is a precedent. Uh, that has been set for the posthumous award of a military cross. Uh, but for some reason, despite Walter's popularity, I mean, he's taught, you know, the, his kind of um, history now is being taught in schools. As I say, he's in the Dictionary of National Biography. There's been a drama about him, a documentary about him. You know, he's, he's He's very widely known now. They still won't award him this, mili this military cross. So sorry, Rene, they they just very, very obstinate about it. All right, thanks for that, Phil. Great to hear you. Keep it up. Thank you. We're also um, really pleased to be joined by Ed Finlayson, who has raised his hand. He'd like to, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? 
Yeah. Um, hi, Natalie. Hi, Phil. Um, many thanks to Phil for tonight uh, and continuing to develop the story of my family, the Tulls. Um, in the main, I want to say to uh, our colleagues, friends in Barbados, I've never had the opportunity to visit, sadly, up until now. Uh, but if anybody finds a relation uh, of Daniel's siblings, I can say that I think on behalf of myself and the family, we would be very delighted to hear from them. So um, I hope tonight might uh, spark a further investigation about Daniel's siblings and a live links to perhaps other families and individuals in Barbados or further afield. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, um, thank you for that. And the, the, the second thing, Natalie, is simply to say the obvious that as a family, we very much appreciate the immense amount of work that Phil has done in the first place to promote Walter's story here in the UK. Um, now the Tal family and the link back to Barbados, which is great and really interesting and exciting to hear. Uh, and I know that Phil is working on uh, a possible publication or book about my grandfather, Edward. So uh, as a family, we're very indebted to Phil and his commitment to tell the Tal story, and we really appreciate it. So thanks to him and thanks to yourself, Natalie. And uh, best wishes to all our colleagues and friends in Barbados. Thanks, Ed. Thank you, Ed. Um, and thanks so much for joining this evening as well. Great. So I don't see any other questions um, or comments. Oh, Iona has also said many thanks for your talk, Phil. And yes, as Ed said, we'd love to find family in Barbados or elsewhere. So hopefully this is a um, you know, nexus to that part of the project that can grow um, as your research continues. Okay. Well, thank you so much again, Phil, for your wonderful talk, um, for kickstarting this discussion. It's been wonderful to have you as part of the history group. And thank you to everybody who's attended this afternoon or this evening, if you're joining us from the UK. Um, thank you to those who jumped in the Zoom and for those who are on Facebook and to my colleagues for supporting the technical aspect of running the history group this evening. Right. Thank you, Natalie. Th thank you for hosting it and thank you for inviting me to do this Zoom. And thanks to everybody that, that uh, took the time out to, to have a look. Thank you. Great. Have a good evening, everyone. Okay. Bye.